The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Something that the Lord's been speaking to us uh, clearly is about changed lives versus just teaching and congregational participation. It was a vision, uh, actually Jason had it a long time ago, to where we saw the, the platform, you know, this would be in, our, in this fellowship, this is the platform right here where you see the worshipers and everything. But God showed it like, more like the, uh, those of you that are familiar with the Tabernacle of David, it was open to all participants. So you say, well, I participate, I, you know, I worship and I sing. But I believe that it's going to be even more of encounter oriented as well as teaching oriented. We need an encounter. And so I think to kind of uh, get this off to a start uh, on the Sunday where we had time change, um, I'm going to have some people share because the significance of this ministry worldwide is that we don't have a lot of people in the room on a, uh, on a Sunday morning, but the viewing uh, is, is in the hundreds and, and thousands over a period of time. And the reports that we're getting from around the world, literally because of internet and YouTube experiences and Sid Roth program and what have you, we've got people that have constantly, we, Vicky's been keeping a record of them, but we never got around to reading some of them. Testimonies from around the world of what the 60 day challenge has done and how it's changed lives. And really, that's what it's about, change lives. The best miracle is change lives from the initial encounter to your born again experience to the subsequent follow up. And what's been intriguing to me is from around the world, it's like it's caught more than taught. Do you believe you could hear a teaching and never catch it? And then you can hear a teaching and catch it and have it change your life and then you want to reproduce according to kind. So we're going to have some people that are going to share this morning who have changed lives, and they're, they're being successful in reproducing it. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, Victoria. Victoria, why don't you come on up? She's got some things to share here. And then we're, gonna, we're just going to have about uh, uh, five or six of you share. Okay? Yep. And you're first. Great. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, it's very bright. <laughs> um, well, I um, am going to share a little bit about myself. Um, and when I first came to Kingdom Life Church, it was actually five years ago. Around that thing? Yeah, great. Oh, that's better. Okay, so it was five years ago next month, and I didn't know exactly when that was until I looked it up in my journal because I take a lot of notes. And um, I found it very interesting because um, there were some things that were shared that day that I walked into Kingdom Life Church that I needed to hear. And um, so I'm just going to just read a couple quotes from Pastor Dennis, just a moment. So the, the name of, um, the title of the message was The Manifesto of the King. And, um, and I'm going to read a few quotes and then I'll go from there. So these were some of the things he said. He said that you have to want a radical change. Life change is not hard. We've made it hard. And then he said, our voice should speak what we believe and what's been changed in our lives. And God is not looking for, or God is looking for unique expressions of Jesus. We were born an original. We are not a copy. Be yourself. So all of those things I needed to hear, and there was many other things in the message. And um, so... 
I wanted a radical change in my life at that time because I was desperate. I walked in there um, that day just a couple weeks before, the first time ever in my walk, wanting to actually not walk with the Lord anymore. And at that time, I'd probably been walking with the Lord for about 18 years, and that was the first time ever in my walk that I ever experienced anything like that. If somebody would have told me that I'd been, I would feel that way someday, I would have said, no way, not me. But I did. And so when I walked in that day, I was desperate. I, um, I had a lot of torment in my mind. I had a lot of things going on in my emotions and in things. So when I walked out of there, I had hope because it was the first time in a while that I actually experienced the presence of God again. And it's, it's so amazing because it was here that I actually really learned that about the corporate anointing. So you know, I was struggling so bad, I didn't even feel his presence anymore. But when I walked into that church that day, I actually felt his presence. So I got excited about that. It actually made me cry. Because I love his presence. I live for his presence and to be with him. And so then I would go home and I wouldn't feel his presence anymore. And then I come back the next week because of the corporate anointing in those that know how to release from their heart, their Bible heart, they're just releasing in the atmosphere all the time. And everyone that's here, are, they're really touched by everyone that's in the room, releasing the love of God within them. So um, so I just wanted to share that, and I really want to encourage people um, that I know that there's a lot of people that do struggle with being tormented in their minds. And, um, and I had a lot of leaders back then tell me, you know, it was spiritual warfare. There was a lot of things like that going on, but nothing ever helped until I um, started doing the 60 day challenge in releasing forgiveness. And it was really all about forgiveness. And so anyway, so that made a huge difference in for me personally. And I really don't struggle with torment and tormenting thoughts anymore. I might struggle with a few other things, but but I really don't struggle with tormenting thoughts because I know that forgiveness is instant and you can forgive. And and he really does take away all your pain and sorrow. But um, I um, just, you know, I'm just thankful to have come to this ministry. I've been changed a lot. I could go into so many different things just about learning how to surrender. Um, you know, I've learned how to do that over the years. Um, and, and I just love that all the areas that the Lord has healed me in, I have um, really desired to help other people. And, um, and there truly is an anointing, you know, when you get free from something to be able to give to somebody else. And, and I've been able to do that. And it's, it's really a wonderful thing and to be a part of that. And so I recently, a couple weeks ago, I prayed for two people, both people, it was very unexpected. I didn't have a, a like, it, it was, it was wonderful. And so one was a friend of mine in California. And I wasn't planning on calling her. I just got in my car and I left work and I just really felt like I should give her a call. So I did. And um, she was surprised by the call. She wasn't expecting me to call her at that time. So um, when I called her, she had shared with me that she had some back issues. And, and so um and she was in a lot of pain, and she, she was uncomfortable. And so I, you know, I said to her, well, would you like me to pr pray with you? And she goes, while you're driving? And I said, yes, I, I can pray with you while I'm driving. And it's wonderful because it doesn't matter really what you're doing in a way because you know how to drop down after you practice the, the principles. Like I could, I really could focus on the road and pray for her at the same time and know that I was in in the spirit. And um, the presence of God was very strong. And, um, and I love how we coach people to go to Jesus within because it makes a big difference when you coach them 
to really focus on Christ within them so that they can receive from the Lord. And so I did that before I started and, and, um, I could feel, I could feel her spirit opening up. She was wanting to receive her healing and, um, and she did. She got healed, and she told me that, wow, I, I'm not feeling pain. But two days later, she sent me a text and said that she's been able to get out, and she still is pain-free, and that a friend of hers came to the house, and she had hip and leg pain, and she got free. So isn't that cool? <laughs> so so um, that was pretty amazing. And, and then recently, I just prayed with another lady, and... Um, and I knew that it had to do with um, an abortion issue, but I didn't know any details at all. I didn't have to know any details. I didn't ask for details. And we really didn't even go into a lot of depth, but she was there and she wanted to get free and because she was hurting. Um, at the time she was attending, she was actually attending a group to get free. And every time she walked out, she said she felt worse when she left than she did before. So um, she she came, we made an appointment and she came and she got free too. And, um, you know, and even that, you know, I just love the teachings here because they really give you all the steps and they give you the how to's in, in every situation. And with her, you know, I knew that she wanted freedom in this area, but I still asked the Lord, where do you want to go? What is it that you want? And it was very interesting because, and I know for myself personally, I've been prayed with before, and and they would do the same thing. The coaches would do the same thing with me. Even if I knew of something, they still waited on the Lord to see what the Lord was going to reveal. And so um, we did that. He did reveal some things, but he knew what she needed, and it did come around to that very thing, and she did get set free. And so... Yep. So anyways, thank you for listening. One of the key statements is when, when you encounter God and through repentance or forgiveness, if the pain doesn't go away, you did it mentally. And that is key. In other words, Jesus takes your pain and your sorrow. There's one for you and one for you. I didn't want you to share because it would cause a dilemma. <laughs> we'd, have to, we'd have to drop okay. down about it. Yeah, you'd have, they'd have to drop have down to release and, forgiveness and, and release to forgiveness point. to each other. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah. As I was thinking about what I could share, it's one thing to experience a change in your life and then to have somebody say, oh, well, I want you to relay that, tell somebody else what happened and break it down, kind of like what Pastor Jen did for Pastor Dennis. He's been experiencing it, but how do you tell other people? And it really makes you stop and f evaluate and refocus again. Well, what really did happen? Did I really change that much? And Terry goes, yes, you did. Trust me. Um, I wasn't raised in Pentecost. I was raised high Methodist where you keep everything in, you don't talk about it, you just, glory, hallelujah, you know, you don't even raise your hands. And it's all well and fine. That, that's great. Been a Christian for a long time. Moved to Charlotte, moved up here, and started uh, experiencing a lot of different churches. And also started uh, attending a lot of teachings, reading, just trying to absorb everything that I could. And... Uh, the scripture that I woke up with this morning is in 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to interpret it a little bit different, but it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that I can move mountains, but but, uh, lost. but I ha do not have love, I'm nothing. I give all I, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but I, if I do not have love, I gain nothing. And I, when I thought about this, I kept replacing the word love with peace. So after I moved up here, I started learning about the gifts of prophecy and words of knowledge and speaking in tongues, and that's all well and good. And was on ministry teams and um, really involved in churches and could and was operating in these gifts. But still, there was something missing. 
And I remember telling the Lord one day, is this it? Is this all? Because if it is, I have a problem with it. I didn't, I didn't want all this just so that I could be on somebody's team or, you know, there was nothing lasting at the end of the day. There was, even all the great teachings that I had, all the, all the generals, you know, um, there was still something missing. And it was, I'd have moments of intimacy with the Lord. I've had, you know, after I'd prayed and fasted, uh, you know, prayed for five hours and fasted for 21 days and passed out on the floor. Then, oh yeah, I've really touched the Lord. Um, but it would just be really a head rush. I wanted to be able to have intimacy with him and touch him all the time. To have that constant, it's like that, yeah, there you are. You know, it reminds me of a child that runs away from the mom but always comes back and touches. It's like a grounding. It's that, that grounding place. And, um, and Terry and I comparing stories when we first met, I thought, well, I have a perfect family. I mean, I'm, I had no problems. No drama in my life. Nothing ever touched me. Yeah, okay, so maybe I was in a couple of accidents and, uh, you know, major surgeries and went through a divorce. And after you start looking at it, I thought, yeah, I I probably do have some wounds. Um, Maybe one or two, but I don't really, I've learned how to deal with them. And I've got them all covered up. And the Lord showed me one day that uh, because I have a scar on my wrist, people who have been burned or scarred, their movements are limited. Okay? Uh, You're your lives are limited. And I had a lot of internal scars. And when I started coming to this ministry and attending the church, I, one by one, the Lord would say, yeah, that right there, that's a scar because you can't move as far. It hinders you from hearing me. If you really want to, if you really want to have that in-depth communication, that, that uh, communion all the time to know and to hear him and how it affects your relationships um, you're going to have to let me peel those. You're going to have to go through some de-scarring, in other words, because everybody does. They're emotional scars, and you've learned to cover them up, and I, I had done a really good job at that. I can put on a good show. I can, I can comb my hair the right way. I know how to do the makeup, but walking it out uh, is a little bit different, and so at <laughs> Terry, you know, you can handle it when you're by yourself. I've got it all together. I'm a single woman. I've got a career. And then you get in a relationship, and it's like two stones going bam, bam, all the time. And so I was like, well, that he was, he was learning to yield. And I was like, well, I shouldn't have to because I know he's wrong. <laughs> and so I had to, you know, there was some things the Lord had talked to me about. And um, it doesn't happen overnight, but what going through the 60-day challenge, because we, at first, did the 60-day challenge together. He said, let's do it together. I didn't want to do it together. I wanted to do it alone. So we fought the whole time. The 60-day challenge, it took us a year and a half to do (laughs) because we were arguing the whole time. I was like, this is not working. I said, I'm going to tell Pastor Dennis on you. And he finally said, (laughs) I told Dennis, and he said, no, no, you're supposed to do them apart. I was like, See, I told you, you're in my stuff. Let me peel my own stuff. I packed my luggage. Let me unpack my own. I drug it in here. So we've both learned to yield to each other. And we said, I think Terry's done it four or five times. I've done it two or three times so that it would stick, so that I would own it. You have to own it. Um, I have. You can't live your life on somebody else's experience. It has to be, as Pastor says, experiential. It's got to be. It's not just words on the page. It's not ink pressed down on, you know, printed on paper. It's not theory or pretty, pretty words. It has to be applicable or why do it? I mean, anybody can uh, read a script and just, you know, act out their lives. But if you can't replicate it, if you can't demonstrate it, if nobody else wants what you have, you know, you're just really a phony, a fake. You look real good and you smell good. You sit on a church pew Glory, hallelujah, you know, sing the hymns. I had all the Methodist hymns memorized as well as the liturgy, the, you know, the prayers and the communion and all that kind of stuff. But it never sunk it, never d- didn't, didn't do me any good. What it's done um, down the line, I kept, and Terry and I uh, compared stories, it starts with you. If you're not willing to deal with you, it's not going to affect anybody around you. It's not going to... I call it flowing downhill, you know, it's not the anointing flows downhill, but 
I have nothing to give the other person. I don't care if it's kids or parents or I have nothing to give them. Why do, why do, why do they want what I have if, if I'm covering stuff up? I'm not willing to deal with it myself and become more transparent to the Lord and let the love of God, the peace of God rule. But I've seen it flow downhill. Now it's affected not only us, the kids in the family, the friends in the family, um, any other relationships, any other ministry relationships that I've had. Um, speaking into their lives, or them asking me, what's what's different with you? you? You know, you can pray over, I want you to pray over me, and I pray differently now. I don't do it the same way. Even to my family in Texas, my father has caught on to it. My sisters have. It's um, I, I see how it's infiltrating and changing. Every, these are the days of not being satisfied with the status quo. I'm tired of walking around with scars. I'm tired of ex- limping. I don't want to. Do, I don't want to limp the rest of my life. I want the abundant life, and that's what this ministry and being a part of this congregation has done. And the teachings. I, th- I know Terry's read every one of their material, and I think I have too. I'm, but but now we've we've collected them and we're rereading them. And every time you read them, you're reading them with a little clearer eyes, and so you can see more and see more and see more. And I've even told him, I didn't see this last time. Why didn't I see this? Lord, I got to drop down about that. I got, got to release forgiveness about that. Why do I have to forgive? They were wrong. But I, want, I want myself free. I don't want to live because somebody else wounded me. It's still controlling me. Yeah. And until you start allowing yourself uh, that freedom and that surrender to the Lord to do it, you'll always limp. You, will, you owe it to yourself. It's not worth living a whole life, especially as a Christian, with such wounds, it's not attractive, number one. And you'll never know what you were fully created to be. Forget the doing part or ministry part. What are you, what are you supposed to be? What did God create you for? What's my assignment, you know? So that's my story. <laughs> I hand it to well, I think she said it all. I'll close. <laughs> We're coming down the road, and she's like kind of practicing. I'm just going to do it one minute. One minute. We already went down 485, 77. She's still talking. (laughs) I love it. That's awesome. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 says, You should know him not by the flesh, but by the spirit. We have to know him by the spirit. November the 17th, two. 2013 that was my day to have my nervous breakdown that was my day to finish what Jacob started with the Lord he was a mama's boy I'm more Esau I wrestled with God all night long it was the worst experience of my life I wished I could have died that night and I had known just a little bit of what Dennis had taught I didn't know enough to to uh Uh, get through the night but uh, about 5 30 somehow I was able to get a little bit of rest and at that moment guys a glory cloud came out of my belly it formed like a mushroom around me I remember thinking it was like the uh, the cloud that took the Israelites out of uh, Egypt Uh, that's what I thought and in that glory cloud it was awesome I was just it was I was in heaven and right there, guys, was Jesus. I actually saw Jesus. He spoke to me. And here's what he said to me. You have so much to be thankful for. You have so much to praise me for. I've been good to you. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, I thank God for that experience. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for appearing to me. Thank you for talking to me. It was awesome. But... That didn't change me. That experience didn't give me what I needed, was looking for. That wasn't the missing link. So when I came to this church and hooked up with this ministry, the pastors taught me how to yield, drop down, vertically, and connect with Jesus in me. And from that connection, that intimacy... Then the pastors here taught me how to horizontally 
connect with my wife and my spiritual family. There's the cross, vertically, horizontally. That's glory to glory. Then I learned to connect with my spiritual family. And in that condition, those three things, I got what I've been looking for my whole life. Satisfaction, contentment, fulfillment, assurance of my salvation, peace, supernatural peace. Gosh, you would think I would have that being a son of a Pentecostal evangelist. My goodness. Well, you think that's why I didn't have it. <laughs> that's bad. Forgive me, Jesus. <laughs> Lord. But I'm telling you guys, supernatural peace where trauma, drama was gone out of my life. No crisis, no issues, no cycles of trouble. The hurts and the fears and the anger and the guilt and the shame has gone. My goodness. What a great place, great way to live. I didn't even have to say anything. I mean, there was such a transformation that it began to affect my family. Christy, my children, my in-laws, outlaws, friends, people didn't like me, wanted to be like me. Ain't that something? They wanted to come to church here. They, I mean, I'm telling you, it's just amazing. So if there's a transformation, you don't really have to talk that much. No, you don't. Praise God for that. So what Christy and I have done from this experience, we are able to give other people what most people are looking for. Y'all know what that is? Affirmation and affirming male voice and affirming female voice. The attaboys, good for you. I'm proud of you. Something's good. The best is yet to come for you. And then once you give those people that, then they'll listen to you when you say, hey, you want my life, you want what I have, then you go to the Jesus in you. And you'll get healed of all of your hurts and pains. Then they'll listen to you when you teach them the location of your spiritual real estate. Then they can get that. Yes, they can. Thank you, Lord. Give me a, one second to make sure I covered all I wanted to say. Yeah, it's really, um, we would not be married. <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't. We're two high Ds. Um, two captains of the ship. We still kind of uh, struggle when I'm driving and he thinks he is. <laughs> and I tell him, I'm in the left seat. I'm in the left seat. I have four stripes. This is when you be quiet. <laughs> so we, and we, we have to trade off like that, but. I was an airline captain for yeah, years, guys. So, so. <laughs> and I, and I had my own life going on. We became good yielders yeah. to each other. Yes, yeah. we have. But I'm telling you guys, this is what I, this is my point and I'll be done. This has really changed my life. This what we have learned, how to connect with Jesus. But to walk it out and to, uh, to be able to have the abundant life. If you were born again, you have eternal life, right? But who has the abundant life? Man, I have the abundant life now. And it is so awesome. And one thing I have done and am doing that is just amazing. Because that cloud came out of me, I can really see that when you yield and release that miracle working power, when you release that divine energy, that, that uh, anointing, that living waters toward the mountains in your life, they will be cast into the sea. I do this every morning. I'll, get, I'll see our bills and I'll just release miracle working power flowing right now. Flow. One time I thought, man, I think Christy's going to think I'm a little off. But I am. <laughs> I release told my finances for financial increase and I'm telling you you get things done one of my daughters that we had had custody of had uh drink a uh I got caught downtown Charlotte drinking uh, uh underage drinking it was a, a serious situation so we went to court um I said Heather and and they were told no there's no way we'd drop that that's just criminal I said oh you're going to drop it watch me and so she the lady was mad at me and she said get in line it's going to take you 45 minutes there's two 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 DAs up there and so we stayed in line 45 minutes, and I noticed that the guy DA was more lenient than the other DA. So I said, Heather, let's attack him. You ready? And so when you yield and release living waters, when there's two doing it, it's a flood. So I said, we release a flood of miracle working power toward this DA. Jesus' name, release that living waters. Release that light of the gospel. Release that, whoo, I'm beginning to feel something. I released it. And I, we did that for about 15 minutes. 
And, uh, and all of a sudden, that DA stood up and just glared at me. Oh, he was mad. I'm like, yeah. We touched those hitchhikers on his wounds. And I <laughs> knew. I said, man, that ticket's going to be torn up. And sure enough, when we got at the front of the line, uh, the, the lady was of age. I said, no, no, you go. You going to let us pass you? Yeah, go. I got this guy. And so we went to him, and this guy was like, uh, how can I help you? I said, would you uh, dismiss this, please? Boy, he just glared at me. And he turned around. He started beating up his computer, and he did about five minutes. Then he turned around and said, you want some good news or bad news first? I said, I'll take the good news. He said, no, you get the bad news first. I can't drop this. I can't tear this up. This is bad. This is criminal. I said, what's the good news? He said, I can't find it. It's not in the computer. <laughs> he said, I know this officer, and he don't make those mistakes. I'm going to have to dismiss this. So yes, you are, right in front of my eyes. But I already knew that he was. So guys, let me tell you, whatever it is, if you can't get your car cranked, if you can't, whatever it is, yield, release, see that river flowing toward that situation, and it will get taken care of. Yes, it will. It will get taken care of. All right. Pastor says I'm done. I'm done. Pastor, thank you. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> He's got such discipline. I was thinking, we may never be able to leave if I give Terry a microphone. And he did great. He did great. Uh, I, love, I love what I'm hearing because it's all changed lives. And none of them use that word that other people use, formula. They have a formula. It's not a formula. It's from the initial encounter with Jesus to the subsequent relationship. It's relationship, relationship. It's not a formula. Don't you love it? Because it's real life. And so far, everyone that shared, I, I have a history of knowing what they're doing, and I've seen the changed lives that were impacted by them over and over and over again. So it's contagious in a good way. Change life is contagious in a good way. I'm going to have uh, Garrett come up and share some things. Garrett's a work in process. We're going to get him saved today. All right. <laughs> First, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Now you can go. How much time do I have? I need to watch this. Um, That's what that clock's up there for. Okay. There's a big one there, too. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dennis and Jen for, Dennis, you're yielding to the Lord all your life, and then Jen being able to pin it down in, for us to have. Um, because it's just, I mean, as my mom says, she thinks y'all live in our house because I'm playing your stuff all the time, you know, and she'll walk through and listen to something. And uh, so whatever comes up on YouTube sometime, maybe two years ago, I'll just listen to it because I'll glean little nuggets all the time. And one of the things that uh, I don't know if anybody else appreciates it with uh, the way Dennis teaches, but if you don't appreciate it, you're going to have to f release and forgive him because he believes in um, repeating repetition getting it over and over and over again. Like you said, with uh, Charles Finney was an attorney because you just got to tell these the jury over and over and over again until they get it. So I really appreciate that because I'm a man and taking notes, us guys, we just can't, we can't take notes and remember everything at the same time. That's why sometimes I would ask somebody over here after church, says, what, did you get that? I didn't get that. Um, but one of the most important things that they pinned down and was the 60-day challenge. And the 60-day challenge is um, the starting. It's, it was my encounter uh, with God in a different way that I'd never experienced. And one of the things that I liked about it is it was um, um, self-deliverance. I didn't have to call Dennis up. I didn't have to call Jan. I didn't have to call Terry and Jason. I didn't have to call them up. I could just learn to drop down to Christ within me and let it flow. So when I started the 60-day challenge, I had to fight to yield because I wasn't really, 
and uh, it was good but then there's like okay one and i'm done i'm done for the day and uh but no i did i did the next one and did the next one and then i got up and it's like wow and then it got to a point to where you know five o'clock in the morning i'm looking forward to it i'm getting up and i'm getting in i get my cup of coffee and and incidentally my cup of coffee there's no cream and sugar in it anymore i just drink it black i don't know why but <laughs> i guess you took all that stuff out of it too <laughs> But so I just, you know, just have migrated to that. But it doesn't matter if you drink cream and sugar in your coffee, you're okay. You're still saved. Um, um, but as I was able to start going deeper and deeper um, with each session, uh, different things would come up. And it was amazing how things would come up from, you know, I'd been, I'd been born again since 1987. And I didn't think I had any luggage. Oh, man, <laughs> the Lord revealed to me, I want to deal with that right there. And I was like, are you kidding me? That, that situation. So I dropped down and I'd ask for forgiveness. And, you know, Lord, you know, I received forgiveness for having that thought years and years ago about that situation. And then I would forgive and then I'd get up and go, okay, boy, that was good. But then I would just have this release in me. And I'm like, I can't believe that thing that I would had even thought about in 40 years, the Lord asked me to deal with it. And so I dealt with it and it starts to free you up. And a lot of things, you know, I was kind of in the impression um, when they were going over, you know, mom and dad a lot. And I'm like, is this Freudian stuff from Dr. You know, uh, Sigmund Freud, I don't know about this mom and dad stuff. Oh boy, mom and dad really, you know, really did some numbers on me. And, um, but, uh, you know, but half the time they didn't even know it. They didn't do it on purpose. It was just, I received it that way. So whether it was a real situation or it was perceived, it was real to me. And it was hitchhikers and things that attached to me, you know, over the years. But, the 60 day challenge literally saved my life three times. I won't go into any details about that, but going through that was allowing me to just drop down and find the Christ within me and release forgiveness to anybody and everybody. Even when I didn't think they needed it or deserved it or whatever, I just like, I can't believe that situation is a part of my life right now. And so the 60 day challenge was so effective in changing my life that, uh, like I said, I was born again in, in uh, 87, but this past two years and the, um, things I'm going through, this is the best years of my life. These last two, even with all the trauma, even with, uh, um, the COVID-19, um, uh, pandemic and stuff like that um there's just all this stuff that's out there it's just so easy to just relieve it first thing in the morning before you even get started you just release that provenial prayer i just release forgiveness whosoever today lord may cross my path and i come down 85 from kannapolis every morning and i hit 77 so i have plenty of opportunities believe me i do and i still get the challenge as a man to you cut me off Ooh, oh he must have needed to get there before me or he just didn't like me and uh, so but uh this definitely a challenge uh traveling on the interstate uh 40 miles twice a day um but sometimes you just get in a cruise and i'll listen to it you know, I'll do my morning prayer time, and then, you know, you really don't have an excuse because the 60-day challenge is they got a 15-minute session with or without music, and uh, then they have the 29-minute session on the, on the Internet, and I'll put that on going to work for 29 minutes. My eyes are open, okay, so, I, so I'm, not getting, I'm not getting the total benefit of it, but I'm getting something and just – you know, just totally releasing. And, and I just, every now and then, I'll just put that 29 minute session on going to work, even though I've done everything I need to do. So there's just potential growth and 
and it just keeps happening and it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And one more thing, the 60 day challenge was so effective in my life. I thought I want more. Uh, do they got more? And then talking with, uh, Dennis, uh, Terry and Jason and somebody had, I don't know, maybe it was Victoria. You mentioned the peace challenge and I'm like, well, I had the book, but I never opened it up. So I opened it up and I'm like, it's the same thing every day. What is this? I thought it was a book to read. No, it's a peace challenge. Oh my goodness. It's good to read or to go through the peace challenge after you've done the 60 day challenge. Uh, it's very important you do it in that order. Um, and I still wanted more after that cause I saw, man, there's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a growth process in your life when you're doing this. And then I decided to do the modules and last yesterday I just finished, uh, the final module and I just can't express to you how they change your life. The 60 day challenge is like your introduction. Uh, I'm a chiropractor. So when a patient comes into my office for the first time, I have to do an interview with them. You know, what are they, what's, what's going on? What can I help them with? And, and if they need x-rays, then that means I need more information. Well, the 60 day challenge, it was like my interview with God. He's interviewing me going, we need to do this, this, and this. The modules is like an x-ray. Now here's all the details of everything that they teach. And it's just phenomenal because they, in those modules, they were able to put forth pretty much, I guess, most of your 42 years of ministry. And uh, it is just absolutely phenomenal. So if you don't think you have any issues, you're probably wrong. Because I didn't think I had any. Do the 60 day challenge, then eventually do the peace challenge. And then I really cannot say enough about the modules. The modules will, I mean, just a simple prayer, you know, at the end of each session, he says a prayer and I'm like, Okay, and I'll pray with him. I'm like, whoa, I got released again. This was done in 2015. And um, so, um, you know, it's just, it's good having y'all in my house all the time. Thank you. Two things. Uh, the Lord spoke to me a long time ago. Uh, I like this for men more than women, but it applies to everybody. <laughs> But you not only walk in the Spirit, you need to drive in the Spirit. Let that sink a little bit. We know the Scripture says, walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill a love. How about drive in the Spirit? You know, there's something about being inside of an automobile to where you are no longer, that's no longer a person. That's a inconvenience, something out there. It's not a person. Yes, it is. There's a person behind that wheel, hopefully. <laughs> so, and the other thing, as far as the 60-day uh, challenge, um, my favorite expression when we used to travel for 12 years church to church was, oh, that's good for so-and-so, uh, but I don't need that. The ones that actually say that are the greatest in need because they're living with a facade that they've got it all together. Isn't that something? You want to talk about deception? The one that doesn't need. That's good for someone else. Matter of fact, that got my father saved. When he said, Dennis, when I told my dad that I'd found Jesus and that I'd changed, you know, he goes, well, you needed that. <laughs> you know, like he didn't. And that's when he got convicted and ended up getting saved because he was basically a wonderful man, period. For an unsaved man, he was wonderful. He showed you how to love a woman. He was a good father uh, uh, to me, but he was a better husband to my mother. And so, but then he said, he got convicted and he said, I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you might think you are. You have issues, you have sin in your life that needs to be dealt with. And he ended up getting, getting saved. But at first it was, well, Dennis needs that. I mean, let's face it. He's a, Dennis the menace needs it. But if you walk in the Spirit, you can drive in the Spirit, right? 
and also the part that uh, Vicky, we're gonna have to get you to read some of those because we have 3,000 students on the online school doing the 60-day challenge from around the world. So it's not just these few people sharing here. We're here. I don't know how many courses do we have all together, but 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, courses. But all of those, uh, I, I just love some of the comments. And again, uh, I'm hearing it a little bit with what people shared, but it's like you can't just say, well, I don't need that. That's for other people, or uh, I've been a Christian. We're getting we've gotten a repetitive type of testimony. I always pay attention to the repetitive type. When someone from this part of the world says the same thing as someone else says, they says, here is someone telling us, this is a 40-year Christian. Here is someone telling us how to do what we already biblically knew we were supposed to do. That's significant. And that is really what's missing. I actually say, and I believe my son Jason has it, a spirit of wisdom. It's what to do with knowledge. Many people are biblically literate and don't know what to do. They have the right answers, but they don't know how to apply it. And wisdom is the principal thing. You've got to know what to do with it. You can't just have knowledge. You have to know how to apply the knowledge. And actually, uh, most people go to school. You should be going to school not just to learn. You should be going to learn to apply what you're learning, right? So, uh, having said all that, um, is there anybody else wanted to share anything at all? Okay. Amen. Praise God. So, when I was working at Master Media, somebody told me about the church. And I was like, okay, praise God. So, when I came here, she brought me the book on a 60-day challenge. And um, when I was reading it, I said, wow, this book, I can feel the Spirit of God so strong on it. And, you know, it was things in me that I needed to drop down and let go. And when I applied it, it came to life in the Spirit of God. He just washed me, and he's continuing to wash me every single day. And I actually got the, um, a book on the soul ties like two weeks ago. And when I've been breaking soul ties with past people in my life because the Lord has delivered me from homosexuality in 2013, I felt I was born that way. But Jesus said, you can be born again. And, you know, I tried to trick myself over and over again. And Jesus said he loved me, but he hate the sin. And I just said, well, I tried to change. It ain't no switch. So he actually delivered me and commanded that demon to come out of my body. And when I got the book on the soul ties, every now and then, like, they would pop up in my head, people from the past, but that spirit wasn't in me, but they were still there. Mm -hmm. And when I applied it and broke it, I don't even think about them at all anymore. And I noticed that some of them try to get in contact with me because they know it been severed. Right. But God say that's an interesting point. When you break a soul tie legitimately, don't be surprised if you suddenly get a phone call. Yes, I I prayed with a with a with a young man. Uh, I know, and yeah, we changed it to a young man because I didn't want anybody to know who it was. All right, so <laughs> this is years ago. Prayed with a young man who said, "I, I my mother controls my life," uh, and. I really, I'm an adult. I, I need to let my, my mate tell me what to do and come to some kind of agreement between the two of us, not my mother. And we broke it. And you could feel the spirit when, when he broke the emotional attachment. She called my office on the phone and says, is my son there? Why have you divorced me? Isn't that an interesting... St choice of words coming from a mother. A soul ties are very real, and it can be not just be a person. It doesn't have to be sexual either. When people hear soul ties, they always think automatically sexual. You can have a soul tie with a person, place, or a thing. I've seen people locked into a location and had a soul tie mm -hmm. with a location 
where if God tried to move you out of that location, you, you wouldn't do it because you, lo you were locked into it. Right. So I'm going to wrap this up. And, um, you know, after I did that, the soul ties were severed. And I noticed that when it break, they kind of is a part of you that they really like. And since it's broke, it's like, I got to get that back. But what they really need is Jesus. That's right. And then I read the book on a deliverance. I ain't finish them all like that. But when a spirit of the Lord lead me to read certain ones, the book on deliverance, I actually got the audible on Amazon. And um, that book is powerful. And it's like, you know, when I started coming here, the Holy Spirit was teaching me a lot. But um, Pastor Dennis and his wife, it's like they put the icing on the cake. Because it's if you want to mature, this is the church to be. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you. Good. Okay. Jason, why don't you close it with just a brief testimony of change? This is my son, and when uh, years ago I can remember a prophetic word saying, You're going to be like Jonah. And I'm going, oh, brother. And sure enough, he kind of went away and then came back. <laughs> I was like Joan. <laughs> um, wow, brief. I don't know if I could do brief. Do whatever. My testimony. But um, I think one of, the, one of the things I did want to share <clears throat> outside of my testimony is the fact that we have so many people, like he was saying, we have about 3,000, close to 3,000 on the online school, and we hear these testimonies of amazing change all the time through emails or text messages or what have you from all over the world. Um, so there's a, there's a language barrier sometimes, but for the same, I mean, but it's the same, it's the same thing that we're hearing here today, which is really great. So if you are on the online school and you're watching this, if you could, I think it would be amazing for our our for our team here uh, to be able to see you and do your testimony. So if you can record yourself video on your phone or whatever and send it to us, um, you can send it to Jason at forgive123.com or let me know through the school. That would be awesome. And if you can't do that, if you could send a, a, an email, um, we would love to start reading those to, to just for encouraging. Because a lot of us, especially during this time of the COVID, we're, we're like... Uh, we very rarely meet together and when we, you know, if, over the last year and, and we kind of lost that feeling of, of that unity and that communion uh, uh, in the fellowship. Um, and when we're on the online school, uh, they, they're really, it's really hard for people to talk uh, together. We can't, we need to figure out a platform. If somebody has any ideas of that, uh, a nice platform that people could actually get together that isn't Facebook. Um, that we could do that, that would be really great too, because it'd be a blessing, because you guys learn, everybody learns a little bit differently. Everybody hears the same things, but then interprets differently. And, and, and to be able to share those, um, those things together is just, would be just amazing. My testimony is just crazy as far as, I mean, I even looked up the other day um, from back when I lived in Kansas before I came here, um, my mugshot's still out there. I was, ar <laughs> I was arrested. <laughs> um, it's still floating around out there. It doesn't, it's not pretty and it's not me. It's, 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 it's who I used to be. And, um, but yeah, I saw, I saw a couple, but anyway, from the, from the getting, um, growing up in the church setting to, um, basically thinking all along that I'm going to follow in my dad's coattails into the, 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 the place that he had at the time in, in uh, Sharpsville, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I just assumed that that's what was going to happen, and that my life was, you know, already planned ahead of time, and I was just going to kind of roll in, and things did not work out that way. Um, and just like most people's lives, they don't necessarily work out the way that they think they are when they're eight or nine or 10 years old. And, you know, how many years have gone by and uh, you think this is not, you know, I'm not the police officer, I'm not the fire chief, I'm not, you know, those things that the, the little boys wanna, wanna be when they grow up. And 
Um, and then they, you look back and you're like, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Where did, where, did I, where did I go wrong? Or, you know, what does God want me to do with my life? And um, one thing led to another, and I struggled uh, on and off through the teen years, just like most teenagers do, um, deciding on what, what to do with my life and, and hearing God in that, in that respect. And he gave me a dream about being in a school in the mountains. And within a day or so after that, we had a mutual friend that um, just randomly called out of the blue and said, hey, I, I have to talk to Jason about this. I, I found a school in the mountains that he, want, he, he should, I think that the Lord wants him to go to. And, and that, started, that started one of those things where you're like, oh, okay. Because it was like the very next day. And I was like, okay, this is God. So I, I go to this school in the mountains and, and, and uh, in the process of being at that school, um, my, uh, my parents got divorced and me thinking that I would be walking, you know, going in on my, my dad's coattails was, was shattered. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing except I knew I was supposed to be at that school at the time. And I was glad I was there because of the different things that were going on at home. I was surrounded by people and um, other students and teachers and things that took me in and we, you know, um, I, I dealt with things the best I could down there. Um, however, it did lead, you know, eventually to, I, 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 my, my family, feel, I felt like my family at home was falling apart. And one of, the, one of the downsides to it was I wanted to latch on to whoever was uh, willing to let me. And so um, I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, developing a relationship with a girl down there in Bible school and got engaged. And, but it was, it was for the wrong reasons. It was because I knew that something was going wrong in my life and I wanted to hold on to something and create something for myself. It didn't have anything to do with God. And eventually after school, it fell apart. Uh, I actually... I. Honestly, I started despising her, and I really didn't like her after a while. But I think it was mostly because of it was my doing, and it was my doing because I was trying to satisfy a problem <laughs> that needed satisfied by God, and I, you know, kind of blamed her for it. And so that fell apart because I treated her really terribly. And after that fell apart, after, after Bible school, after learning everything that I could, uh, being set aside for God for years in this school, um, I, I, I backslid tremendously. And it was in the, the furthest that I've ever gone. And the people in my school that I had graduated with um, wouldn't have recognized me. And I started um, chasing after women instead, you know. I had that 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 lack of uh, relationship with God and with my father. I hadn't talked to him for years after school. I was very angry, and so I tried to substitute <laughs> my relationship with God and my my relationship with my dad that I needed, and filled that void with women, for the most part, um, and it was like. I mean, it wasn't even, it was, it was really all girls. I wasn't like food. I wasn't addicted to food or anything like that. But I, I took that, that companionship to, that I really needed, and I, and I stole it from other people. You know, it, it wasn't right. And there was a lot of things that, that, uh, that transpired that, that I, look, I looked back on in the process and, and was just like, I was, that was ignorant. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was ignorant. I mean, I, I, I got people, you know, there was people that I worked with that I had fooled around with that were married. There were, I, I caused divorce in other families. I mean, I, I was, I was, and I didn't care just because I wanted it. it. I wanted what I wanted. I wanted, I was selfish and um, I just got lost. Well, anyway, my picker was broke 
for the most part after that too. And even when I decided to have a, a, a decent relationship with somebody, decent meaning, you know, I didn't plan on cheating on her. Um, it was still so very wrong and um, had very little God involved in it. I was angry at God. I was angry at my dad. I was, you know, um, I felt gypped in life. And so it was like I wanted to take back whatever I could to make it, you know, in life. I just wanted to, I, I deserve something for all this garbage, right? <laughs> I was very angry. I I came to a point where um, the couple of the girls that I had, had dated, the first one, um, she she to try she tried to kill herself several times and now we dated for like three years and I didn't realize that she was a blackout drunk. She was a blackout drunk. She would drink on the weekends, but she would drink like two large bottles of wine within like a half an hour, just suck them down, and then she would black out for the entire weekend, and then wake up and then go to work. I had no idea. I just thought she was unavailable at, during the weekends. Um. So I, she had that hidden for a year, but then she tried to start. She just, after maybe a year and a half, two years, she decided that she no, didn't want to live, and she, you know, would drink, and then she would cut herself, or she would take pills, or she would smash her head on the wall, or she tried four different times, and it, and it was really, really, really bad. And the one time I found her half dead. And her her apartment was all trashed, and there was blood everywhere, and it was just like a, uh, it was a horror movie. And um, we got, I mean, I called nine one one, and I ended up having to carry her down the hall while she was bleeding out everywhere, and head to toe, because um, she had taken a lot of pills that, you know, uh, together they they caused an anticoagulant thing going on in her body so she basically couldn't stop bleeding no matter where it was she was head to toe a bruise and uh, bleeding out of her eyes and ears and everything it was literally a horror movie when I found her um, and you know we got her to the hospital I decided at that point I was like going to turn my life around and I really needed God because this was this was a horror horrific scene that I had just experienced and um, I rededicated my life there at the hospital. I broke up with her while she was on, the, on the hospital bed. I said, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't be with somebody that wants to kill themselves. And she understood. And uh, eventually, she got saved, and uh, got, got doing really well in life. And we had our ups and downs. And we never, we weren't together, but we were friends still. So I take her to church, and and then I, and then at church, I started to. Um, I, I was on the uh, uh, the team where people come in, the newbies would come in, and I was actually part of their staff. And so things were good. And I, at that point, I, I started maybe talking to my dad back and forth a little bit through email, not real often. But I but I eventually found that I needed to, to really forgive my dad. And, and I think that because I, I miss, I realized that there's something missing that I'm not going to fulfill with a girl. There's something really missing, and something's wrong. And and um, I shared the 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 book, um, Honor's Reward by John Bevere, with my dad, and we went through that. And it was one of the first releases I ever had in the spirit, and the beginning of of a new creation, me. <laughs> um, because we read the book together and went back and forth and. I didn't say, I, I can't say I made all the right choices after that because after that I soon found a, 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 what I thought was a spot on perfect match for myself when I moved to Kansas and she was just like the, the most godly woman and, and sang in the choir and made cakes for the children of the church that didn't have much money and for their birthdays and just all this wonderful stuff. I thought she was the bee's knees, and it ended up that she was very angry um, and psychotic, but I didn't realize it until I started calling her out on things. Um, 
even three months after we were dating. And and I would like look at her her phone and be like, who is this? And it was her ex-boyfriend. And I'd say, well, th- th- isn't this your ex-boyfriend? I thought you don't talk to him anymore. And then she'd start getting angry. And Well, anyway, one thing le- led to another. And every time I called her out on anything that I would catch her in, um, she became, she, you know, became violent. And, um, and I wasn't used to that. I, I, I mean, I grew up with my brother and yeah, he was, you know, we got our, we had our fights here and there and, you know, fist fights or whatever, but it wasn't that big a deal. But this was, she was very angry and, um, would throw things at me, beat me with anything that was around that she could. And, um, if, especially if I caught her out on something, um, that, that was the truth. It's, it's weird when, you know, when, when you have a, a pathical, you know, like a pathological liar, um, who does it so well, and then you catch them in it, they either, they either turn and find somebody else to, to, to con, or they go ballistic, because it's like you, you are tearing down the world that they created for themselves, you know, you're, you're you're questioning their 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 reality and their truth that they created, so then she went ballistic on me. I mean, I remember the like one day, she blew up an egg in my microwave. Like I don't even know why you would be microwaving an egg, but she exploded it and went all over the it went all over the inside of the microwave. And when she came to me and said, well, "How come you didn't clean up the microwave?" I was like. First of all, I didn't know it was in there because I didn't, haven't used it. And secondly, it wasn't my mess. <laughs> you know, uh, you did that. And that didn't go over very good. And she um, she punched me and slapped me and eventually um, crushed a can of stewed tomatoes on my head. And I had a big goose egg. And the tomatoes went all over the wall. But there was like so many of those instances, it was just like ridiculous. and And so... Um, when I, when I finally was like able to get my thoughts, I mean, in the process, I mean, I, I never, we never fought, like I, I, I never, you know, hit her or, or anything like that. It was like always me trying to defend myself and, and I didn't realize there's certain things that you, you can't restrain somebody from hitting you. Well, a woman anyway, you can't take her keys. You can't take her phone. There's a bunch of things that I learned in the process <laughs> that are illegal uh, to do, which the cops then told me when they were arresting me what I shouldn't have done. And the things, the, the, the thing was, is like I didn't do anything. And she called, she called 911. All I did was curl up on the bed while she beat me with stuff. I remember at least the floor fan. A long, I mean, it could have been there's an iron. There's all kinds of stuff. But I just covered my head at one point because I was like, I'm, I, I'm either going to die. She's going to kill me now. or, And that's when the, finally the police came. And, of course, then I got arrested because in that, count, that particular county, you're, you're, if you were a male and you're in, that, in a, a DV, you, had, you were pretty much already, that it was your fault. It, you didn't have a chance. And it was because there was so much domestic violence in that area that they created a particular law in that county that they automatically take the mail in and it turns into a state issue. So anyway, I was arrested, spent the night in jail and um, my, my awesome job that I had awesome opportunities in, um, they're like, where did he go? Where is he at? He's either dead or in jail. My bosses actually came to my door in my apartment and the door was open and so um, the the head of the 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 my mate like the top boss in my where I, I worked for and and one of his assistants came in and they looked around my apartment and they're like he's either dead or he's in jail and he's like I hope he's okay so I ended up losing that job I mean they they voluntarily wanted to keep me but at that point it was downhill um, I was so uh, I thought for sure, because I, all the lies that she told me, regardless of the beatings, I still wanted to make sure that I was there for her. And I paid her bills, and I paid her you know, medical stuff, I paid her rent, I paid for her car, I paid for car insurance, 
anything that I could, she eventually started depending on me for. She lost her job because, well, she blamed me. You know, you, you made me lose my job. You, you stressed me out. So I had to quit. Stuff like that. Um, it weighed on me for a while, but um, I just uh, I, I felt stuck. I couldn't. I felt like I couldn't fight back. I felt like the the police. If I got police involved and said, you know, she's a lunatic, you know, I don't know. I recorded everything on video, watching her scream and kick. She actually kicked with her bare foot a hole in the the bathroom door because I used to hide in the bathroom. Um, you know, to get away from her. And she had a flip-flops on, and she kicked. You know, that's how demonic it was. She was able to kick through a wooden door. But I had everything on video just in case. <laughs> she didn't like that very much either. She kept trying to get my phone because she knew I was recording everything. So I felt stuck. I felt trapped. And um, the one thing that I... that you know, Dad and Jennifer had offered that I would be able to come out to their place if, if I needed some restoration. And that was always an offer that was out there for me. And and um, when I finally called him up, I said, I lost, this is it. You know, I, I tried to kill myself. I tried to jump out of the car while she was, you know, beating me, um, driving past IHOP in Kansas. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to live like this anymore. Uh, I would rather die or be in the hospital, as long as I could be away from her, I don't care. And and I said, you know, I don't want to die. This is, a, you know, this, that was a wake-up call. I said, if you guys are still willing to take me in, I, I want to come. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I, I need I need to, I need help. And I had, you had, you know, you have to make that decision to, to, to just stop and get out. The one thing that, that the Lord um, showed me through all of it is that no matter what situation that you're in, no matter how hard it feels like you need to, what, what change you need to take, you know, it's, it's, there's always an opportunity that he gives you a way of escape. You know, what, what is that? There's a scripture that he doesn't tempt you past what you, anybody else's, you know, temptation's ever been. And there's always a, a, a door of escape for you that's, that's placed it might not be an easy thing to 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 walk out from. Like I thought she was gonna die. I feel like I'm kicking her to the road because I'm not gonna be paying her bills or rent or anything like that. And, and she needs me to live. And I was so wrong, you know. And and but but God is so good that He gives no matter where we're at in our lives an opportunity to to come to Him and to get things straight. And I think that I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to be encour encouraging to other people. I know that some of that stuff is is repetitive, and some of it's just awful. But you know, the sixty day challenge. When I got to their house and started doing the sixty day challenge, I I came off of five different medications, depression. I had PT PTSD from all the that one situation. All gone. In fact, my allergies left. My my poor kids, are, my poor kids are sniffling right now because they've been out they've been outside so often with this with the with the great weather that we had, and and the the allergies are, it's allergy season with all this pollen and stuff in the air. So hopefully someday they'll get healed from it too. <laughs> but it's like the the food allergies went. I I wasn't a, you know addicted to any type of medications i had no withdrawal symptoms i just it, it's the 60 day challenge when you start dealing with things it's really important to look at the look at the prayer time that you have when you've created judgments against yourself big 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 healings are on the other side of that judgments against yourself you release judgments that any judgments that you had against yourself and watch what he does physically mentally emotionally those were big things for me, and a lot of it was tied to like the the allergies and the different things. So I just want to be encouraged. I want you guys to be encouraged, and there, there's a lot, a lot of testimonies out there 
oh, all over the, the, the world right now um, with the online school. And uh, we really like to hear them too. So anyway, all right. <laughs> Amen. I'll tell you, it's, it was great to, uh, to watch the transition before our eyes. And uh, there's nobody too damaged. There's nobody. We used to get tired of hearing that. Oh, but you don't know what I've been through. I've seen, 45 years, I've seen people have been through more than whatever it is you're talking about that you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> and you know what we would have to do? We'd have to reverse that and just say, but Jesus knows. See, they want to put it, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, tell that to Jesus. You're going to... You won't get away with that, will you? Jesus, you don't know what I've been through. That'll stop that right off the bat. But big and little, it's all small for God. Big and little is our perception of things. So I still remember remember that uh, when Jason came and he started working on it, the transformation, it really, the, the major work was done in less than 60 days. And then the progressive work continues after that for all of us. None of us are done, but the bulk of the garbage can be dealt with. The bulk of the past even. And then we have every now and then we have people say, oh, I don't need to deal with the past. Uh, my past is over. I don't think about it. I forgive and forget. That's not even scriptural to forget in your head. The place you want to forget is right here where God washes it out and you've got peace. You remember in your head for the purpose of reproof and instruction where you, the sea of forgetfulness is in the spirit realm to where he took the pain and the sorrow. You remember without the pain. You remember without the pain. That's when it's in the sea of forgetfulness. God's not an amnesiac. and He doesn't want you to be an amnesiac. And I've watched people hurt and suffer trying to forget. I'm going, you can't forget all you're doing is suppressing it you weren't meant to forget in the context of memory you want to remember without the pain that's when you know you've forgiven from the heart if you're still talking about the that time so-and-so did this that time so you did not forgive you're in sin and that's the truth if you're still talking about it it's the sin within that's doing that because forgiveness and repentance takes the pain and the sorrow, not the memory. Although you forget here, this is a good place to forget because it, all the pain and the sorrow that were attached to that memory are gone. Not only that, but there's even an anointing on the other side of your healing to help other people. Yes. How about that? I've seen alcoholics that were delivered. They have a powerful ministry that, that they can spot an alcoholic in the spirit and they can minister effectively. Okay, uh, this was, we're running a little overtime and that's good for you. Some of you need overtime, but we win in the overtime experience, right? So Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit, cause it to multiply in the days ahead. And the, and the Lord's really speaking to us that the, even what Jason shared about your relationship with God, people, and, and uh, like Terry shared, with the, with the congregation, there is a group, there is a time for a governing anointing to take place, and it's two or three. You don't need huge quantities, huge numbers. Huge crowds are not going to do it. What's going to do it is the power of where two or more are gathered together in my midst. We're going to need more and more of a one accord anointing to where there's no walls between you and God. The way you treat people is the way you treat God, right, Victoria? The way you treat God is the way you treat people. So if you think you've got a great relationship with God and there's people you, that you have a problem with, you, you've got a problem with God because he's in the people business, right? Okay, Father, we thank you for this day. Yes. Seal it by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full
Soul Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.